Okay, welcome everyone. It is now five o'clock and time to begin. My name is Gabby Williams and I am a part of our policy team here at TASH. Welcome to today's training entitled Steps to Create an Action Agenda, What Can Your Chapter Do? Presented by Jennifer Bertrand and Barb Trader. This is the second part of our four-part webinar series, Chapter Skills Development, Making Change Happen in Your State. Recently, a number of important federal laws and regulations aimed towards improving the lives of people with disabilities have come into effect and require quality implementation at the state and local level for their impact to be fully realized. Therefore, this series is designed to help develop the full range of skills necessary for chapters and members to make changes in state and local policy. The format of today's series follows that our presenters will speak for roughly 50 minutes and then this will be followed by 10 minutes dedicated to participant questions and answers. However, you do not need to hold on to your questions until then. If you think of a question as we go along in our presentation, please press the raise your hand icon in the um, upper right corner of your toolbar. Our presenters will address questions as they come in, so don't hesitate to engage and pose questions as you see fit. Um, your participant microphones are enabled currently, so if you have a microphone on your computer, you can pose your question via the webinar audio. Please note that microphone um, is defaulted to mute. To pose a question, you must activate your microphone. If you'll notice the microphone icon at the center of the top menu bar, you can go ahead and click that and it will activate your microphone. When your microphone is active, the icon will appear green so you know that um, you are engaged. We request that you keep your microphone muted when not actively participating so as to minimize audio interruptions. If you do not have audio on your computer, you can use the chat box in the lower right corner to type your questions, and our presenters will read them out for the rest of the participants. Lastly, notice the green speaker icon at the top, center to the left of the microphone icon. You can use this drop-down volume control to adjust your individual volume of presenters and speakers. So, all right, if you guys are ready, we'll go ahead and get started, um, and I'd like to introduce our fabulous two speakers. Today we are very excited to have Jennifer Bertrand and Barb Trader here to give us guidance on creating an action agenda that will allow your chapter to set clear priorities based on TASH values, identify and gain allies and influence, and to see genuine success in your state. Jennifer Bertrand is a dedicated mother of four beautiful children. Born with one hand, she has found a different way of doing things. Jennifer provides information and training related to legislative process and public policies that impact families through her work as a le legislative liaison for Community Crossroads. During the 2013-2014 legislative session, Jennifer successfully coordinated hearing testimony on behalf of parents and mobilized many stakeholders across the state. This collaboration and effort led to the successful passage of Senate Bill 396 relative to child restraint and seclusion practices. <laughs> Barb Trader is Executive Director here at TASH. In her role at TASH, Barb leads a praise, the Alliance for Prevention of Restraint, Aversive Intervention and Seclusion, a 23-member alliance of national nonprofits with a mission to eliminate aversive, <laughs> aversive interventions. She also serves as co-chair of the Education Work Group for the Collaboration to Promote Self-Determination, which is a 15-member coalition to advance high-impact public policy. So now please join me in welcoming Jennifer Bertrand and Barb Trader. Great. Thank you, Gabby. And thanks to everybody who's joined us today. I want to particularly thank Jennifer for making time to um, participate in the webinar today. Um, as you may have noticed, between my what um, Gabby shared about my background and what she also shared about Jennifer, we both work on restraint and seclusion issues. Um, TASH works at the national level, and um, we've been really watching what Jennifer has been able to do in New Hampshire on behalf of kids. We don't, always, we don't work only on restraint and seclusion issues, though. We work on all issues that impact people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So um, I'm really pleased to have you here 
today, Jennifer. Thank you. So, I appreciate the opportunity. <laughs> great. Good. Thanks. So um, many of you were on our teleconference on Tuesday, and you worked through part one with us. If you weren't part of that, um, just know that we've archived these sessions. So... Um, you can see it for the first time or review it if you would like to. Um, part one focused on the reality that we have a really good federal framework of um, civil rights legislation that protect people with disabilities and actually um, create programs to support people with disabilities to live great lives in the community and have full access to integrated education, um, integrated jobs, and um, lives in the community. However, the states don't always implement um, federal law like we would like to see them implement. And they have the wherewithal to um, implement at a really progressive level. So what it takes is committed advocates at, in each state to make sure that the people that we care about are um, able to lead good lives and have policy support them in that direction. So today we're going to get started on what can your chapter do and what is it? what do you do next? If you're interested, then what are some of the next steps? And again, our goal here is not to provide you with a step-by-step -step recipe book as much as because it's so different in every state. We couldn't do that. It wouldn't serve you well. So what we are doing is giving you the things to think about in order for you to create your own step-by-step -step strategy. So um, let's get started. Today's agenda is to um, remind us that we, grind, we ground our policy work in our values. That's really where it all begins, and that's where um, we will establish our principles for where we go with policy. Secondly, we're going to talk about how do you do a gap analysis. Um, we know what we want based on our values, but what's what's the gap between what we want and what we have. So um, we'll spend some time talking about how you determine the gap. Um, and then we'll talk about a policy or a power analysis. And this is who in your state is concerned about this issue and what's their position on it? What's their self-interest? Self-interest is a really important um, concept to understand when you're doing policy work. And then we'll talk about setting priorities and why it's important to set priorities and why you have to be very, very selective about what you take on in order to be successful. And then we'll talk about how you can identify success short term, mid term, and long term. So that's what we have on the agenda today. Um, our quote of the day is change starts when someone sees the next step. So um, many of us had mothers that told us that uh, the most difficult thing in getting started is getting started, <laughs> is in any project is getting started. So um, defining the next step is really um, what makes us all successful and um, get underway. I also really like um, this thought in it. Um, and this is sort of what we're hoping to get at today is a paradigm or a practical model for social change that includes an understanding of ways to transform consciousness that are linked to efforts to transform structures. So another way to say that is how do you change hearts and minds so that systems better support the people we care about to have good lives? So as we said on Tuesday, we start with our vision. Um, here's kind of a pictorial representation of what we're all about. It's about people with pretty significant challenges leading really good lives. And our um, vision is a world in which people with disabilities are fully participating members of their communities, 
and communities where no one segregated and everyone belongs. That's a pretty clear description of our vision. But in more detail, and to get to the heart of it, especially as we're considering a gap analysis, is what does that mean in detail? And what we mean is that people with significant support needs should be able to enjoy a quality of life very similar to everyone else. They sh it shouldn't be such a struggle. This would mean that all people are presumed to be competent to direct their own lives. So is that what we have in our states? That's the question you want to ask. All people have a way to communicate. Again, is that the way it is right now? Are all people, do all people have a way of communicating? Third, are fully included in their neighborhood schools? And I think I know the answer to that for most states. Have protections against abuse, neglect, and aversive procedures? Have the tools and opportunities to advocate on their own behalf? Have a home, recreation, learning, and employment opportunities based on their personal vision of a quality of life. And finally, have individualized supports that accommodate their functional needs so they can have all these things. So the question is, how close is the reality in your state to those things? And the gap is what we're going to work on changing. So as I said, what's the current condition in your state compared to that vision that we have? What data sources can you tap to find out what the difference is? What day-to-day -day experiences do people in your networks have that may give you some information about how close we are to that vision? And is there a policy framework and structures in place that support what you want? Those are the questions to ask. So Jennifer, kick it off. OK. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry about that. I've lost my document. I have too many windows open. <laughs> there we go. Sorry to keep you waiting, folks. I seem to have lost That's my time. All right, take your time. <laughs> oh God, this is so embarrassing. Okay, here we go. Um, so I wanted to share a, a brief story with you about an experience that I had. And I want to emphasize that sometimes, you know, making a simple request can lead to a big change. Um, and don't ever en uh, underestimate the power of one person and, you know, the mom momentum that we can create and ignite when we recognize that something's wrong or something needs to change. Um, I've done a lot of work. I could tell a lot of stories, but I'm going to share one particular one with you. My daughter, Chloe, she has a, a profound developmental disability. She had an issue with her ankle and had an orthopedic surgery. Uh, and for the first time in her life, we experienced some new challenges, you know, uh, physical challenges, because she had a long leg cast and she couldn't bear weight or walk for more than five weeks. Um, her brother played lacrosse at the time, and we would go as a family to cheer him on. But the field had these really narrow turnstiles that wouldn't accommodate her wheelchair and you know she could only attend on days where my husband could be there and he could piggyback her through and we'd have to enlist ass assistance from other people to get her chair over the fence. It was so incredibly convenient and it was such a big hassle and it was really hard like on the first day I, I didn't know that you had to make a phone call in advance to uh, arrange for you know your child's uh, practice or game to be on an accessible field. Um, so, um, it really frustrated and angered me. So, uh, I was, I went to a, a, a meeting with our local Able New Hampshire, uh, chapter, 
uh, that I was the chapter leader at. ABLE is um, Advocates Building Lasting Equality in New Hampshire. We're a grassroots organization that takes on disabil issues that impact people with disabilities. And, um, you know, whether you're a veteran or you're an individual that experience a, experiences a physical disability um, or um, an acquired brain injury and you have different uh, mobility needs, it just it didn't seem right. Something had to change. So at the meeting, um, much, well, I, I suppose it was much to my surprise. Sometimes I think we feel alone in certain situations that we encounter. But as it turned out, there were multiple um, people there who had experienced the same things. Um, and then as we began to talk more about it to other people, we discovered that other people in the community were frustrated and had the same experience. So another pa uh, mom friend of mine, Paula Garvey, we made an appointment with the rec director and we shared some stories about the families and individuals that we had met with who were all in really excited and supported doing something to change this, to make it more accessible. Um, and we talked to the rec director about, you know, the difficulties and the barrier it presented for families and how important it is for us to ensure our communities are welcoming of uh, people of all abilities. And we asked that a couple of gates be installed to ensure easy access anytime someone who had a physical disability that wanted to attend a game or a practice. We noted how much mothers would in, uh, appreciate as well with small children, they'd be able to use a, a baby stroller. It would just make our community, community a much more welcoming place. So um, there was a little bit, there were a couple steps in the process, but last fall, uh, accessible gates were installed and now everyone can easily participate and use the field. You don't need to make a phone call in advance. Um, and it's important that we recognize that things need to change it's important that we recognize um, when something's wrong and that we have the courage to do something about it. In this case, it really was one sit-down meeting, uh, maybe some phone calls and, and talking to other parents when we're out in the community or at our schools. Um, so I guess what I would say to folks is that, um, you know, let's have the courage to do something about these things that we recognize are wrong. Don't be afraid to make the changes. Because if we don't, then we risk repeating um, mistakes of the past. Uh, so in the words of this Latin proverb, I'm not sure if you've ever heard before, but fortune favors the brave. Um, so let's have the courage. And whether you're making this type of a change or if you're focused on um, policy changes, um, oftentimes a simple request can lead to big change. And um, it's, it's interesting to find out how many other people share the same type of passion or concern or frustration you do and how that really brings people together united to achieve something important that makes our world more friendly and more accessible. Is everybody there? I muted my mic. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I, <laughs> I was like, oh, no, was I muted the whole time and no one heard anything? <laughs> no, it's not you, it's me. I wanted to just um, mention to folks that this is just a small example of a very small change that happened that had some big impact, community-wide impact. But this is a situation that is described by a woman that actually got a state law written and passed. So... You know, there's all um, there's all kinds of levels of change that can take place once you get started. Yeah. Well, that's just so, a small example of you know, start small. Didn't want to overwhelm you with the restraint and seclusion story. Um. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, another um, quote that I just wanted to share is that. Um, and this is uh, something that we hear a lot of is that people are. It's some of the people that oppose our, our work believe that we're asking for special favors. And I think it's important to remember that real equity means not treating everyone the same, but attending equally to everyone's different needs. And that's why uh, that drives our public policy work as well, that notion of what real equity really means. 
So in terms of um, doing a power analysis, I'd like Jennifer to just share um, these next few slides to describe what that means and give you some hints on how to get it done. This, this is when you determine the particular gap area, the issue that you want to work on. So then what, Jennifer? Um, so, you know, who cares about this issue um, and what's their position? It's important. And it'll mean different groups of people for different issues. Um, I'll give you some examples. When we worked on the issue of restraint and seclusion, and by the way, um, you know, we had a lot of great uh, collaborators in, in making that happen through different organizations as well. Um, but for like restraint and seclusion, um, you know, what did the DOE think about making some of these changes? Um, what, what were some of the key legislators that would have uh, leadership roles in um, guiding maybe how legislators voted on the issue? What were their thoughts about it? What did they even know about it? Um, uh, local and state agency, um, other, you know, it might be your school board, um, business community. Uh, for us, you know, we have some providers that provide some community-based services. This law would have served to impact them as well, so it was important for us to know um, what they thought. Um, oftentimes, uh, communities of faith, you know, your principles are going to be in line with their principles. Where do they stand on it? Um, uh, and then, of course, uh, other families you know uh, and families they know. Um, what do they think about it? Is this important to them? Um, and then, of course, professionals that work in the field, whether it's like an administrator's lobby or uh, a teacher's union, you know, what do they think about the issue? Where do they stand? And there might be other people as well um, beyond that. Uh, other groups or organizations, like in our case, like the NHLCU, uh, who turned out to be a very big supporter. And uh, one thing, uh, uh, Barb, I'll mention is I can't see the page, uh, the slide numbers on here, so it's kind of throwing me a little bit for a loop. <laughs> I didn't know if there was a way for me to activate that. Oh, now I can't hear you. You must be muted. <laughs> This is, this is slide number 11. Okay, it's 11. And, okay. Um, and I don't know if you want me to mention, like, for, we worked also, I'm happy to announce that New Hampshire's uh, just passed uh, Senate Bill 47, which will uh, make it illegal to pay someone with a disability a sub-minimum wage simply on the basis of their label of having a disability. Um, so, in examples, you know, we worked with the Labor Department on that. Um, you know, employers, we needed employers, uh, talk about employers who, you know, this was important to, they wanted to know, was this going to impact their bottom line? Um, again, parents and individuals. Okay, oh, power now. Slide number 12. <laughs> okay, um, this is my first time doing a webinar, by the way. Um, so let's take a look at this. So how do you find out their position? Um, well, oftentimes these organizations um, like uh, a teacher's union or um, like NAJA, we have a special education um, administrators group. Uh, they'll have a website and they'll have like their mission and they might even have topic issues and a statement about what they believe. Um, so that's always an easy way to start. You know, it's a good place to start. Um, and then um, if you get updates from different groups, I always encourage families to sign up for as many different updates from different groups that might um, have the same type of interests that you have. So you know what they're doing, you know what they're saying about the issues that are important to you. Um, you can attend public stakeholder meetings to find out more about what different groups or, or folks feel or think about a particular issue. And this is a good way to discover what we call self-interest. Um, self-interest is not being self-interested or selfish. It's not being selfless where you just do things and you don't get out anything out of it. Self-interest has more to do with like, um, what is it that I'm trying to achieve? 
that's in line with what they're trying to achieve and how can we work together in order to achieve that. Um, and, and you could also think of it as a way of, um, you know, what's, what do they get out of it? What's their advantage? Um, and when you can identify their self-interest in terms of how it's aligned with your self-interest, that's when um, you have the potential of making a really strong collaboration and working together. Let me know when you're ready for me to Next turn slide. the slide. 13. Um, so for each issue that you're considering, um, again, think about who cares about this issue? Who will this issue impact? Not just families and individuals, but broader than that. Depending on the issue, I mean, I focus kind of like on educational types of things here, but um, if you have a community-based service system like we have here in New Hampshire, um, you know, it might impact your area agencies. We have 10 area agencies that provide um, home and community-based services to children and adults who experience developmental disabilities and acquired brain disorders. Um, so who else cares about that issue? What is their self-interest? If you work together, is there an advantage that both myself or yourself and that organization or group um, would be able to achieve to move you know, both of you forward in your quest and passion to make change? When, when you can identify that and when that is true, you can achieve great results. Um, and if we could go back just one more second, how do you appeal to their self-interest? This is a really important part when you're meeting with them um, you're trying to find out about those things. Maybe you've done some pre-research. Um, if you're trying to persuade them to work with you, then I usually make it a habit to frame it within that person's values because um, our moral values influence our decision-making more than anything else. All right. Um, let's see. Next one here. Which slide number is this? Is this 14? Uh, Okay, yes. uh, so for each issue that you're considering, oh, okay, so we're still on 14. Okay, can we go to the next one? Oh, okay. Did I skip one? I thought I was, I was supposed to talk about allies. I didn't, okay, I didn't finish that. So, okay, I'll give you some examples of important allies. And by the way, when you can identify like an unexpected ally, um, it's extremely powerful. Um, an ally that you would probably expect um, to, to be on your side when we worked on restraint and seclusion, the NHCLU, the C Civil Liberties Union, you know, we want to be free from these harmful practices. We want school to be a safe place for not only our kids, but our teachers too. Um, my, my professional background is education and I am a certified teacher. Uh, we want um, the, the classroom environment and the work environment to be a positive place. Um, one unexpected ally that we were able to gain when we did this work uh, was a provider. The National Children's Home uh, provides uh, support, sometimes housing, um, and education to some children in our state who have extremely profound behavioral challenges. And they stood with us and they testified on behalf of the bill that we should have an extremely high standard of harm. They said, you know what, even though we support some children have the greatest challenges with behavior, we don't use this practice, or almost never, uh, outside of an extreme um, uh, ex you know, emergency, which you know, rarely happens. Um, so you know, that really got our legislators' attention, and they sat up and they really listened. You know, if these folks felt comfortable in managing child's behavior, why would we have to rely on that in our public schools? So that, that's a really good example. So making a list of those folks and maybe meeting with them um, and uh, organizing with them about how you're going to move forward and having a, an agreed upon set of um, messages or talking points is a really important part of being successful. Great. Um, so I, um, let's talk about you know, what's doable, and most people who are involved in advocacy have full-time jobs, maybe not even related to these issues. Um, they have busy lives, they have families to feed, they have all kinds of things going on in their lives. Most advocates in the United States are not professional advocates. The vast majority of social change is driven 
by people who don't do it um, professionally. So particularly in terms of social justice action, most people do this in their, in their um, free time. So because of that, and that is the way TASH is structured too, our members are all volunteer advocates. Um, for some of us, it may be related to your full-time job, but for the most part, it's not. So because of that, we have to be very strategic and very um, realistic about what we're able to accomplish in order to get things done. What we want to make sure of is that people don't take on so much that they get too discouraged and they quit. That would be a terrible outcome. So we want to make sure that people get involved. They take on something small, um, realistic, accomplishable, and they use um, some small um, advocacy effort that they can win on quickly and become um, and celebrate. Uh, somebody changed my format on my screen. Was that me or was that you, Gabby? <laughs> I don't know where the slides went. Okay, there they are. I didn't realize it was going to affect your screen. I'm, I'm still learning this. Sorry about that, Barb. Got it. Got it. So we want to make sure that um, we're realistic. And it's kind of hard for us that are passionate about this, these issues because we see need. We want to respond to the need. You have to be very disciplined about this. So my guess is that most of you are either affiliated with a chapter or um, you're interested in starting a chapter. But if you're affiliated with a chapter, really pay attention to this, and that is to start small and s start with something that you can get done in a reasonable period of time. So if inclusive education, for example, is your concern, and you um, are very concerned that, let's say, 90% of your kids with severe disabilities in your state are in segregated classrooms, then you have to think of something that's very incremental that you want to change in order to get to your big change over a period of years. And the first thing might be that you develop a relationship with your Department of Education. And that you, that might be the first thing. Um, but it would be good to decide what a good win would be. So maybe the good win would be that, um, you become, um, you get something that you want inserted into the state systemic improvement plan, or that you get a new regulation um, adopted by the State Board of Education. You need an um, incremental step to your big goal. That's the point. So, to pick your issue and to pick what you're working on, you want to pick something that's small and that's achievable within a short period of time. You want to you want to use it to learn and to develop your capacity for change. You want to use it as a learning experience. So you're going to spend a lot of time asking for advice, seeking partners, um, building your own capacity. You want to pick something that the success will keep people interested within your group. Um, so what's going to be the biggest win for the most people? You want to gain credibility with each success. So you don't want to pick something that's so big that you never feel success. Then people get tired and they quit. Um, and that gets to the next point is that big ambitious agendas to start with become overwhelming um, and so on. So the, the, this is really a sales job on why it's important to set priorities. Um, we could have individual discussions about what issues you want to pick, whether or not that issue is a good fit, whether or not your strategy to address that issue is the right strategy. Those are separate conversations. This is basically to just encourage you to start by thinking small. 
So here are some additional questions to ask when you're thinking about the issues that you want to take on. First, what are, you got, what are you best at? What do you have the most expertise in? What issue matters the most to the most of your members? What issues are the easiest to solve? Uh, Jennifer gave a good example of a pretty easy to solve issue, which is, can we make this field physically accessible? Uh, you know, that, that did take two, two gates. Um, it's not a huge systems change issue. It's pretty tangible. Um, can you partner with other people? Partnering with other um, allies can make your job so much easier. Um, so if you see partners right away for your issue that you know you agree with, that you think you can learn from, that might be a good way to go. Is there something that's going on in your state or that you would like to impact on your state that you would like to take the lead on? Usually that means that you're the most likely to have the most expertise and to care the most about it. So that's what makes it natural for you to take leadership on. That's probably why Tash ended up in a leadership role on restraint and seclusion because 15 years ago when it first was coming up in the national conversations, Tash was the the organization that was bringing it up, that was caring about it, that um, was seeing a real national concern. Um, and then finally, what issue might have the biggest impact? That might be a consideration. It may not, but it may help you get to um, the priorities that you want to set. So in terms of defining success, um, first, I think it's good to start with where is your long-term vision. Um, we talked about Tasha's vision at the very beginning of the webinar. You can look through that list and you can make them very specific for your state, especially as you understand where the gaps are. So in some states, sheltered workshops don't exist anymore. So taking on sheltered workshops isn't really relevant. But maybe the employment rate for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities is still not where it should be. So maybe your long-term vision is to increase integrated employment. Um, and then, within that big long-term goal, what can you get done this year? What is realistic to get done this year? And can you identify that, um, particularly since you need steps to celebrate along the way? Um, it may be a multi-step process within a year. It usually is. Um, it's really important when you're learning advocacy and as you're doing it over time to debrief every step that you take, to sort of um, talk amongst yourselves about how it went, what did you do right, what would you do differently next time, who else needs to be at the table, so you debrief each step. Um, and like we've said before, you need to celebrate each time you take one step. Celebration is really key. It helps people stay engaged. It helps remind people that advocacy is a long-term commitment. It helps people feel good about the way they're spending their time. Celebration is you know, it's all part of the um, essential nature of keeping your volunteer advocates really, really appreciative of um, the leadership and the opportunity to make a difference. So as you're considering your priorities and the issues that you want to take on, then you want to look at, um, to set your strategy, you want to think about what steps you're going to take to achieve your goals. So here's some of the ways you can um, make change happen. Um, we call them levers. Here are, um, here are opportunities for action or levers for action. Um, one is that states have a very important role in terms of interpreting and determining how they're going to administrate 
uh, federal programs, you can. It's very legitimate for advocates once a federal program is announced, like the recent HCBS waiver program, the new rules. It's very legitimate for advocates to sit to ask for a meeting with the state, to sit down with the people responsible in the state, and just ask, "What are you going to do?" What can we expect in terms of your administration of this program? Um, we really want to. Just, yeah, I've just yes. attended a stakeholder meeting for the setting requirements for HCVS. So definitely reach out to your, um, you know, uh, Department of Health and Human Services, if that's what you call it, um, and ask them to be included on a list so that you know when that's happening. It's an important way to be involved. Right. Yes, and once you have those initial meetings, then that might fuel your need to um, develop a strategy around what you've heard. That'll help you clarify what your next steps are. Um, states also make plans and set priorities. There's a state plan for every federal pot of money every year. Um, some plans are three years long, some plans are five years long, some plans are one year. For example, um, in terms of the education of students with disabilities, um, the Office of Special Education Programs has what's called a results-driven accountability process. This is part of state monitoring. So they measure states across a set of metrics, they issue determination letters. Some of you are in states that did very badly in the state determination process, but all states are required to write a state systemic improvement plan. They're called the CISIPs. Becoming involved in the development of the CISIP is a really legitimate role for you to play. Um, to make public comment, on the CISIP is a really legitimate role for you to play. If you don't like what's included in the CISIP, you can make real noise about not liking what's in the CISIP and either do that through a, uh, a meeting with the State Department, a meeting with other allies, or through the media, um, or through a letter writing campaign. There's all kinds of avenues you can pursue. But the bottom line is that the state plan, in each of the ways that federal, funny, federal money flows into, into the state, the state plan is a way for you to have impact and influence. States are expected to involve stakeholders through federal law in each of these processes. Um, they're expected to involve stakeholders in the development of the state plans, they're expected to involve stakeholders through a public comment period. Um, you need to pay attention in the area that you're the most interested. Um, and if they're not involving you uh, appropriately, and I know through my conversations with the Department of Ed as an example, they're not universally happy with the way State Departments of Ed are involving stakeholders. So um, I think it's... Um, very legitimate for you to track that, complain about it if necessary, and insert yourself. Um, states also determine the enforcement mechanisms for all these federal laws at the state level. Um, they have a complaint process. That's a legitimate way to advocate is to really load up the complaint process. Um, they have um, they, you may want to comment on their enforcement mechanism and complain about it. That's another opportunity for advocacy. Um, you may want to inquire about the enforcement mechanism if you don't know what it is. And if it's not transparent to the public, that's a problem. So this is another area where you can, uh, where your lever um, is for um, advocates. Um, data provides you with a powerful lever if most states are compared with other states on all these disability programs, there's um, state outcome data 
on um, integrated employment. There's um, now there's the National Core Indicators, which is not a federal um, measurement system. It's through the National Association of State Directors of Special of uh, Developmental Disability Services. But anyway, there's a data source for how the quality of life as perceived by people with de developmental disabilities in states. There's um, there's the LRE data state to state that most of us are familiar with. So comparing your state to other states is also another way to advocate and to, um, to use that information to ask for something different. And then, of course, we all know um, that Tash is really pretty skilled at identifying what are evidence-based practices and whether or not states are identify are living by those evidence-based practices. Um, does P is PBIS implemented well in your state for students with severe disabilities? If not, that's something you could take on. So this, this slide is really about helping you, uh, another way to think about how to choose your issue and your strategy. Again, it's all about the next step. <laughs> um, these are the data sources that I shared with you on Tuesday. Um, there, the Tuesday slide actually was more comprehensive with more resources for data, but these are some of the same um, data sources. Um, Jessica, you ask, does Tash have a source for the EBPs? I don't know what you mean by that. What are EBPs? Evidence-based practices. No, um, evidence-based practices are uh, defined in education through the What Works Clearinghouse. You would find it on the Department of Education's website, and it's called the What Works Clearinghouse. But when we talk about evidence-based practices, these are well understood in the field of um, what's been shown to work through both research and practice. Yeah, they just don't have very much for the moderate and severe population. So um, Jessica, I don't know if you're a current TASH member or not, but um, the evidence-based practices are pretty well understood by the by the committees that we have in place. So if you have a question about any particular one, you can email the office and we can direct you to the right resource. So here's the data that um, sources that you can find what's happening in your state. And again, we talked about this Monday too, the data about what's happening in states isn't good. Uh, some states, are, many states are doing well in certain areas, but universally we know that uh, kids are still very mostly segregated in public education, that discipline is uh, much more often used against students with disabilities, particularly restraint and seclusion, that there's excessive segregation in adult life, particularly when you consider the way that federal money is spent. So it's all about you guys and what you can accomplish locally. And the message for today's um, webinar is figuring out what you're going to get started on. What issue are you going to pick? Pick it narrow. And what's your first step? Um, and this is just a good reminder. I think that um, we've all seen advocacy groups um, make mistakes, I think, in how they position the people that they're supposed to be advocating for. And I do think that that's where the phrase, nothing about us without us, came from. So as we're doing our advocacy work, we need to be, remem we need to be very mindful that we're respectful and that we respect the dignity of the people whose um, lives we're talking about. 
Um, so if you can do nothing else, do whatever it is in your power to make the people in your life feel completely unashamed of who they are. And I think the best way to um, empower people is to get them involved in advocacy. So these are just reminder slides from Monday. And now I'd like to take questions from the group. Are there any questions that anybody has for today of either Jennifer or I? A quiet group today. Someone's typing. We got some people typing. You guys can turn on your microphones. Uh, Thank you, Allison. Thank you. So let me ask you guys a few questions. Have you been thinking about what you'd like to take on in your state? What issues concern you? You can turn on your microphones. <laughs> uh huh. Inclusion. So, Allison, um, I think your concern is shared by a whole host of people. So, the question is where are you located and are you part of a TASH chapter? And hi, Suk Young. Great. Um, Allison, I'm glad that, to know that you're in Richmond. Um, you might think about um, paying attention to what's ha happening in Arlington County Schools. There's a group, a fairly large and growing group of parent advocates in Arlington Public Schools who are working toward inclusion including kids with severe disabilities in the general education classroom they have a couple of, because of where they're located in Arlington, they have several attorneys who are parents of children with severe disabilities who are involved in the advocacy work. So attorneys are typically not afraid to weigh in, it, but it doesn't require attorneys. Anyway, what they're doing is pretty exciting and they're really organized and they are, um, they have approval from the Board of Education to have two to, to do a pilot program in two elementary schools to include all the students in um, general education classrooms. They did this only after one year of working together, which is pretty amazing. So, um, oh, you met with Tana. Good, excellent. I'm I'm glad you're tied in. So I'm speaking to this group next Tuesday night. Um, I'd love to meet you if you can if you can drive up to um, to Richmond from uh, or to Arlington from Richmond. We'd be glad to have you there. All right. Well, we'll include you some other way. But I, I would use her work as a model to see if you can replicate what she's doing in Richmond. You have a lot of you have a lot of allies in Richmond through the university and through other sources. So. Um, I hope we can talk more about that. Suk Young, you're still typing. She was. She had a media question: on how to uh, more about ex accessing media to bring awareness to issues. So, um, Suk Young, I'd like to know a little bit more about. Um, you know, are you working with a group? It's really hard to access media if you're an individual person. I don't, it's very difficult. Unless you have something that's atrocious and horrible, 
um, it's much easier to um, bring media to a, a situation if you have a group working on something. So my que if you could answer that question, Suk Young, then we can go from there. Okay, um, Allison, um, I thought you said something else. I see that you are planning on joining the... Oh, speaking with Liz and Maureen, that's good. Excellent. And Suk Young is uh, working with her state legislators, holding school districts accountable for services uh, for children who with deaf, deaf blindness. Um, well, so, yeah. Suk Young, I understand that most groups receive federal funding. Um, remind me, are you in Kansas? Okay, so what you want is for, um, we, first we can send you the list of TASH members. You guys might want to, maybe it's time to consider creating a TASH chapter for, this, for the purpose of advocacy. Um, there are 12 university professors at the Beach Center or at, in the Department of Special Ed who are TASH members. They don't have to do this as university representatives. They can do this as individual citizens. And so can the, um, I know that ABLE New Hampshire benefits from a relationship with TASH members who are professors at the University of New Hampshire. And they do it as individual citizens. They don't do their advocacy as university professors. Am I mm -hmm. right, Jennifer? Yes. Yes. So um, you can create a group of advocates um, with TASH. And then they can, um, it's hard as an individual to work with groups. It's easy for groups to work with groups. So you want to create that structure of like-minded people and then join in with other groups whose job it is to advocate. So you've got maybe the Autism Society, maybe the Down Syndrome Society, maybe the Arc of, of Kansas, maybe um, the DD Council can do advocacy work. They're allowed to. It's part of their mandate, actually. Maybe the PNA. So you can work with those groups. Um, but I, I think first your job is to get a group together so it's not just on you. The media is not going to pay attention to you as an individual person who cares. Um, and probably neither is uh, a state agency. I hope that helps. Inclusive housing. Well, with the new settings requirements. <laughs> um. So, Victoria, are you part of the TASH chapter? Oh, great, Sukyang. Good. Now you are. Okay. Um, I think Shirley is still on the line. Um, yeah, Shirley's here. Shirley is involved in adult services as well in, in California. And Caltash at the, their last conference had the director of DD services um, as a speaker, and he also did a town hall meeting, and I heard it was great. So Caltash already has a relationship with their relevant state agency. Um, and I know that there are many members of Caltash who are really interested in housing as an issue. So I would first have a discussion with Shirley on how to connect with those people who have that interest. And then they know other groups in the, in the state. For example, Easter Seal Southern California is very involved in housing issues. And I think that there are, um, there's knowledge of other organizations who have that interest. So that would be the way to pursue that particular interest that you have. Great. So anybody else have any questions at this moment? All right. Well, we're, we're so appreciative of your time today and glad that you were on the phone. Um, I'm going to wait till Andrea asks her question so um, we have an, 
ability to answer it, but I want to remind everybody that these sessions are archived. Great, thanks, Andrea. Uh, that you guys have access to those archives. You can show these archives to a bigger group of people so that those people who were not able to participate today can have access to them and you can use them to sort of develop your plans and to work with a group of people to get together on what it is that you choose to do. I also want to remind you that next Tuesday, I'm sorry, the next session is next Thursday, the 23rd, and the woman that, um, uh, let's see, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Allison and I were um, talking about Tana um, is going to be co-presenting with me, and she'll share a little bit more about what they're doing with Arlington Public Schools, but she'll also talk about what she's learning as an advocate. And this is a, um, Jennifer described herself in part as the mother of Chloe. Tana is the mother of a kindergartner who is just come out of the gate charging as an advocate That's mom. Awesome. And she's, she's just going to have real impact. She'll probably have impact broader than just Arlington County is my guess. Yeah. So um, you can look forward to hearing from her next week. And then our final session of the series is on the 30th. So thank you all. I hope you have a great night. And once again, thank you, Jennifer, for thank your you time Barb. today. Sure thing. Take care, everyone.